Mr. Ambassador, uh, my first question, as you know, China has the presidency of the UN Security Council this month. Your ambassador recently spoke about cooling off the political hotspots around the world through mediation and the promotion of peace and security. How do you reconcile these words of your ambassador with China's increased military exercises in the Taiwan Strait? As I mentioned earlier, uh, this kind of uh, crisis or escalating tension in the Taiwan Strait was caused solely by the U.S. provocation, plus the separate forces in the Taiwan uh, island. So I think if people would like to see the situation to be de-escalated, uh, they should urge the United States to stop the wrongdoings and to be back on the track to the One China Principle and also the China-US three joint communiques and also for the separate forces in the Taiwan Island, the Taiwan region to stop their separatist activities. Canada is calling it an escalation of tensions. What do you make of that? You mean Canada is joining that? Canada is involved in the G7 uh, you know, ministers meeting you know, and uh, pointing fingers at China's you know, justified countermeasures. So that's certainly uh, is not uh, acceptable to us because it's also an infringement uh, on our sovereignty and the territorial integrity. And we have made our position very clearly to those countries uh, to urge them to stop this kind of thing and to honor their commitment to the One China Principle. Are you issue, issuing a warning, a formal warning to Canada? And um, are you considering reprisals? We have made it clear to uh, the outside world that anyone, any force uh, who is uh, you know, doing things that is uh, detrimental or harming our uh, national security, sovereignty, and the territorial integrity, they will be met by the resolute countermeasures on the part of the Chinese side. Um, China, as you know, dispatched uh, 100 warplanes and 10 warships as a, as a show of force. Has China reached out for dialogue, the dialogue that your UN ambassador um, spoke of, dialogue to, to reduce uh, those political hotspots? Um, so have, have you reached out to, to, for dialogue with Taipei? Uh, you know, over the years, we have made it clear as long as the uh, authorities uh, in the Taiwan region, uh, they uh, recognize the year 1992 consensus, which embodies the One China principle. Uh, we are more than happy, you know, to have discussions with them. But unfortunately, since Tsai Ing-wen took office in 2016, you know, her authorities had refused to recognize the year 1992 consensus. And the more dangerously, uh, they have been uh, going down the wrong path, leading to the incremental uh, Taiwan independence. So that's a dead end and that's leading nowhere. So we strongly urge them to stop these kind of activities. Also at the same time, we strongly urge the United States not to support Taiwan independence. And uh, anyone who is playing the so-called Taiwan card is like playing with fire and they will be uh, perish you know, by it. That, that sounds like uh, an ominous um, warning. Yeah, indeed, because that's for the Taiwan question. It's a core of our core interests. And on this particular issue, we have no room for compromise. An invasion? Some people are worried about an invasion of Taiwan. Is that on the table? You know that we will certainly do everything possible to achieve you know, the peaceful reunification. At the same time, we are not renouncing the, those necessary measures, and they are uh, you know, targeted against the separated forces in the Taiwan region. So we will do everything possible you know, to make sure that the final reunification is there and it's the trend of the times. You know. Mr. Ambassador, in June, um, Canada uh, said that China showed some 
concerning and unprofessional behavior while harassing its pilot, its patrol aircraft near North Korea. Then in July, uh, the Chinese foreign ministry said that China hopes that relations with Canada can get back on track. Um, what signals are there that the relations are improving between China and Canada? For the uh, incident of the mili military plane of Canada, it's very obvious that is uh, intrusion into China's airspace. So that's why we have made those, you know, uh, issues, you know, clearly our position clearly to the Canadian side opposing this kind of activity. For the relation, you know, uh, in a general term, you know, I believe that China and Canada, you know, uh, actually we can do a lot of things together. You know, bilaterally, there are strong ties for trade and investment, for personnel exchange. I mean, the Chinese students coming here, you know, for higher education. And also, uh, you know, on a regional level, uh, China and Canada can do a lot of things together to make sure that we uh, not only preserve, but also promote peace and stability in the Asia Pacific region. And globally, uh, China and Canada, we can uh, work together, you know, to make sure that we help the international community tackle the problems like climate change, food security, and the biodiversity. Of course, uh, for that to happen, for all those important cooperation to happen, we have to make sure that we abide by the principle of mutual respect. So it is really hoped that the Canadian side will uh, be working uh, towards the same direction together with China to uh, enhance mutual understanding, to remove obstacles, and to uh, handle the sensitive issues in a constructive way. And uh, so we can build more mutual trust between the two sides. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, on, on the theme of mutual trust and improving relations, is, isn't there an opportunity that perhaps is being missed in the case of the Canadian citizen and Muslim Uyghur Hussein Chalil, he's serving a life sentence in China. Why not dialogue with Canada and find some common ground on this case? We have made our position already very clearly on multiple occasions that this particular person uh, is a you know Chinese citizen. So for the Canadian side is not entitled you know, to be uh, involved in this kind of thing. You know. uh, and we have the channel open for all the issues you know, before our, uh, between our two sides, but certainly because this particular uh, person is of Chinese origin and the Chinese citizenship. Uh, this man has been detained for 16 years. Um, how could he pose a threat um, being reunited with his Canadian family? We are handling the things uh, in strict accordance with Chinese law. Um, and I, I want to talk about uh, the Indigenous issue. Uh, Canada has recognized its historical wrongs involving Indian residential schools, and they've recognized this as a genocide. Will there be a day uh, in the future when China recognizes its treatment of Muslim Uyghurs, treatment which the Canadian Parliament has recognized as a genocide? For what the sum of, of the people in the Canadian government, they have concocted a lie of the century, accusing China of a genocide you know, taking place in Xinjiang. But the truth is that in Xinjiang over the past six decades, the Uyghur population increased from merely 2.2 million to nowadays it's over 12 million. And the average life expectancy for people in Xinjiang region, more than 60 years ago, it was only 30 years. And nowadays it stands at 74.7 years. So do you think there's any genocide in Xinjiang? Actually, it suggests the uh, uh, blackening the Chinese image, so those anti-China forces. So we are strongly opposed to that, but we welcome the people from all over the world to go to Xinjiang to see for themselves. You know, the people in Xinjiang are living in peace and harmony. Actually, just a few days ago, uh, the diplomats uh, based in Beijing uh, from about 30 Muslim countries, they went to Xinjiang for a visit. And after the visit, 
they were very much impressed by the people there. You know, they are living a happy life and uh, very, very different stories from those you know, covered here in the media, in the Canada or in the United States. So really, I would like to see more Canadian people, you know, as the situation gets better for international flights to visit Xinjiang to see by themselves. Well, would you be open to um, um, a visit by international media to the province with unfettered access to, to Xinjiang? You know, a lot of journalists have already visited Xinjiang and really, you know, after the visit, they have, you know, been uh, uh, learning a lot and uh, very different stories from uh, what have been covered here in the Western press. So really, I hope more and more people will be there, whether it's diplomats, journalists, or tourists. So, so you would be open. So China would be open to have independent, uh, international recognized media to go to Xinjiang. They even have the human rights high commissioner from the United Nations, you know, going there, you know, a few weeks ago, you know, and she also has drawn the, you know, a lot of conclusions different from what's been reported in Western countries. Uh, on a closing note, so where do uh, relations between Canada and China go from here? I think, as I mentioned, you know, for the two sides, uh, we need to focus on the positive aspect and also to make sure that we handle the uh, those differences in a constructive way. So really, it is hoped that the Canadian side will work together with the Chinese side to make sure that the relationship will be back on track because that only now serves the interests of our two peoples, but also, I believe, is conducive to peace and the stability in the Asia Pacific and even beyond.